Next on a special edition of Currents News, Religious Freedom Week sets its sights on church vandalism, something that's been a problem in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Whether they're on a busy street in Brooklyn or tucked into a quiet garden in Queens, church buildings and symbols of faith are under attack. I'm Jessica Easthope with how the Diocese of Brooklyn is coming together to combat vandalism. Plus, Vice President Kamala Harris visits the U.S.-Mexico border after numerous calls from lawmakers. The death toll from a Miami building collapse rises as crews work tirelessly to find survivors. And an arrest is made in a terrifying shooting that had two children caught in the crossfire. The news starts right now. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of Currents News. I'm Emily Druby in for Christine Persichetti. Friday marks day four of Religious Freedom Week with Catholic bishops calling for prayer on church vandalism, hoping that people who witness the crimes are brought to Christ. The Diocese of Brooklyn has seen a number of vandalism incidents in the past few months. Currents News' Jessica Easthope has more. Father Miroslav Podimniak can give a tour of all of the places around St. Adalbert that have been vandalized. But as you see on the corner right here. Graffiti on this wall and this wall and the latest incident, the statue of Our Lady of Angels destroyed. People are looking for consolation. They are looking for support in the church and the church itself is being hit. They put uh, metal bolts inside. The statue was recently repaired for free, but not every church that's had a sacred object damaged has been so lucky. This statue of Our Lady of Guadalupe had to be replaced. Last September, a man was caught on surveillance video hurling the $7,000 original to the ground at Our Lady of Solace Church in Coney Island. And at St. Athanasius in Bensonhurst, someone tore down this crucifix. These are just a few examples of the vandalism that's happened not only in the Diocese of Brooklyn, but across the country. The harmful acts attacks on the objects themselves, but now many fear it's part of a larger attack on religious freedom. We have statues outside, beautiful buildings to show our faith and have a space for people to come and to worship together. And that is being taken from us. Uh, by this act of vandalism. We need your help, dear mother. During Religious Freedom Week, Catholics are called to respond to aggression with compassion, something parishioners at St. Adalbert's are finding in their hearts. I said, please enlighten the mind of this guy or whoever did this, because whatever he did, he didn't know that it is wrong. St. Adalbert's is having cameras installed around the statue in the garden, hoping it prevents another attack. In Elmhurst, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. And Monday on Currents News, our Religious Freedom Week coverage continues, taking a look at the Christians being persecuted in Iraq. That's Monday on Currents News. Vice President Kamala Harris made her first trip to the southern border since taking office. Harris visited a migrant processing facility in El Paso Friday, where she spoke with U.S. Customs and Border Protection agents and even met five young girls from Central America. Her trip comes after she received criticism for not having visited the U.S.-Mexico border during her first foreign trip to Guatemala and Mexico earlier this month. Harris also met with Catholic bishops on the front lines of the border crisis, mentioning them while reciting a Bible verse during a press conference. Bishop, I thank you. Um, if you don't mind me quoting scripture. Go for it. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. So that is a lot of what informs our work. And of course that crosses many faiths. Her visit comes days before former President Trump is expected to visit the border with Texas Governor Greg Abbott and other representatives. And national correspondent for the Tablet and Crux, John Lavenberg, will keep us updated on the vice president's trip to the border and meetings with religious leaders. You can find his reports in the paper or on the tablet.org.
At least four people have died in Thursday's partial collapse of a residential condominium in Surfside, Florida. Officials say 159 people are still unaccounted for. Search and rescue teams are carefully combing through the wreckage as the building continues to fall down around them. At this point, no official cause has been given, but two researchers found the building was sinking for years and lawsuits were filed in the past over cracks. The community is receiving help from across the Sunshine State. The 160 human beings that are sitting there in the rubble, we're being told that things are being done. We're being told that they have the best crews. I'm not discounting their crews. I'm not discounting what they're collectively trying to do. But at the end of the day, they don't have the ability and the capacity to be able to do this. Crews are starting to use heavy machinery to pull rubble from the site. They're facing challenges like fires, water pumping, and shifting materials. More teams from around Florida are, will arrive soon to help out. The Archbishop of Miami, Thomas Wensky, has released a statement praying for the victims, saying, quote, Our hearts go out to all those affected by the tragedy. Our Catholic charities and local clergy have joined with other voluntary agencies and faith leaders to assist in whatever way they can. We also also pledge our prayers for the victims, their families, and first responders. May the Lord give them strength. Former police officer Derek Chauvin has been sentenced to more than 22 and a half years in prison for the death of George Floyd. Chauvin was convicted in April on April 20th on all three counts for the death. Video showed Chauvin on his knees on Floyd's neck for nine minutes during an arrest in May of last year. Prosecutors asked for at least 30 years while Chauvin's defense called for probation. A man has been arrested for a Bronx shooting that narrowly missed two young children. We warn you, the video of this incident is graphic. Police say this is accused gang member Michael Lopez opening fire on a man who then trips over the kids. The victim was shot in the back and legs but will survive. The brother and sister were not physically hurt. Lopez is charged with attempted murder, assault, and reckless endangerment. The Daily News reports he was previously arrested for attempted murder. New York City voted for who they want to be in the mayoral ballot in November, but the results could still take some time. While ballots are still being counted, currently Eric Adams holds the top spot at 32% of the vote. He's followed by Maya Wiley at 22% and Catherine Garcia at 20%. Once a candidate reaches 50% of the vote, they will be the Democratic candidate against Republican Curtis Sliwa. But that could take a while thanks to a new voting system called Rank Choice Voting, which asks people to pick a first, second, and third choice for mayor instead of just choosing one candidate. Currents News spoke with political analyst and expert from St. John's University, Brian Brown, about the new system. I think ranked choice voting is a good idea, but it, we're really diving into the deep end of the pool with the mayoral uh, primary. Voters will learn. They're going to learn very quickly about it. There has been some good educational materials out there, the tablet. You've seen ads on TV trying to teach people how to do it. But I think it's important to, to recognize that most of the delay is coming because of New York state law. There are statutory requirements that, that mandate how and when ballots are postmarked and how long you can wait before you count them. The city's Board of Elections plans to reveal the first round of ranked choice results on June 29th on its website. There's a lot more news headed your way. Catholic school students from around the Diocese of Brooklyn had their academic home runs celebrated. Plus, as pandemic restrictions are lifted, couples are booking their dream weddings and overwhelming vendors. I don't think I've ever felt anything like this before, and I've been doing this for 10 years now how they're keeping up with the rush to say, I do. And summer is here, but Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio wants to make sure people are still making it to church while school's out. He joins us after the break. There are now some big changes to the tablet website. You can get personalized access to the Catholic news you value. Sign up for free at thetablet.org.
The Diocese of Brooklyn took to the baseball field Tuesday honoring the academic achievements of its graduating students. Catholic Schools Night was sponsored by the Diocese and DeSales Media Group, the parent organization of Currents News. I was there for all the excitement. They're in the stands, but Michael Sheehan and Kaylee Cruz are the real winners at this baseball game. It just feels really nice to be here. The two snagged the top academic spots at their Catholic Academy, a difficult task during an impossible year. It's just so exciting to find, be with my classmate, to be honored, to have a medal and everything. Gym classes weren't normal and all of our classes weren't normal, but really just making the best of it with my friends was probably my favorite part. Making the best of it, that's what the pandemic forced students everywhere to do but not on Catholic Schools Night. Instead, at the Brooklyn Cyclone Stadium, there was laughter. <laughs> a welcome sight, explains Associate Superintendent Joan McMaster. Being able to be here tonight all together and not have social distance and really, really celebrate with their friends is really such a tribute and honor to them. 55 valedictorians and salutatorians from primary schools across the Diocese of Brooklyn. Another very important person in the Diocese of Brooklyn was also celebrated. Ed Wilkinson got his very own bobblehead and even threw out the first pitch. Brooklyn is back and our event is back and you know we're, we're really happy that we could get as many people in here tonight for this event and give the kids the recognition that they deserve. Ed is the retired editor of The Tablet. The paper's parent company, DeSales Media Group, sponsored the event, which is in its third year. Gina Krainchich runs it. A public way of showcasing the excellence of our Catholic schools and how our children are working so hard and graduating uh, this year in a very difficult year. We're very happy to do that. DeSales is also the parent company of Currents News. A night to honor the students, also to send them a message, explains Monsignor Jamie Gigantiello. We're proud of them, we're proud of what they have done, and we want to, you know, make sure that they have a great future and they know that they always have a family to come back to. Also to honor the family that supports them, like Liana Salaj's parents. They're my like, biggest inspiration and they helped me throughout the whole year. Teachers and other school staff were also there to cheer on their students. It was truly a home run night to top off a home run school year. A century old tradition is making a comeback to the streets of Brooklyn. Preparations are underway for the Giglio to dance through Williamsburg, celebrating the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel and St. Paulino de Nola, a triumphant return after the festival was canceled last year because of the pandemic. The celebration starts Wednesday, July 7th and ends on Sunday, July 18th. For a full schedule, visit olmcfeast.com. Here to talk to us more about the summer in the Diocese of Brooklyn and how the church is hoping to keep parishioners safe during summer fun is the Bishop of Brooklyn, Nicholas DiMarzio. He joins us with former tablet editor Ed Wilkinson for Into the Deep. Ed? Thank you, and Bishop DiMarzio is with us today. Bishop, as the summer approaches, uh, people are really getting fidgety and they want to get out. And they're, they're tired of this pandemic and staying inside. Uh, they, do you encourage people to get out and, and to be in crowds and to go out and socialize uh, uh, more than they did last year? Well, I think we can more than last year, but still we have to be cautious. I don't think we want to take chances. Um, the fresh air is good. I think that the, and being outside without a mask at times is, is called for, but uh, there are times when we should still be cautious. I think we don't want to let our guard down. Mm -hmm. uh, certain parishes have great summer festivals, uh, particularly, you know, we have the Giglio uh, Festival in, in July in Our Lady of Mount Carmel in Williamsburg, which is scheduled to go ahead, although the details have not been worked out yet. Is, uh, what are you saying to parishes about how they should approach the summer and the sponsoring some of these processions and festivals that they love to have? Again, we're asking them to contact the civil officials, police, and others who who uh, to give the permits for these things, you know, they're, they're not done without permits. And that we would know at least what the civil government uh, recommends and will allow, then we can go ahead. These are annual things that really have a long traditions behind them. A certain some of them are really go back 100 years. Mm -hmm. So it's something we want to encourage. If it can be done, we'll do it. And again, we individuals have to be responsible for themselves. If they're not vaccinated, they really need to still wear a mask 
mm-hmm. when they're attending any of these events. Yeah, a lot of parishes provide very valuable sur- uh, summer services for young people. They have Bible classes, they have social activities at the parish, day camps. Uh, what are we advising parishes to do in terms of these kinds of programs for young people? Again, we're allowed, we're, let, we're letting them happen in our schools and the parishes that, are, that normally do these things because they're important for the children. They have given them activity. The lack of socialization over this year has been uh, difficult for especially children. They need to be with other, other children to socialize, to, uh, to find the normal kind of life that we, we need. Mm-hmm. Of course, the 4th of July is, uh, is upon us, and some people have problems celebrating some of these holidays, uh, American holidays, because they have problems with the roots of America, and they're saying that America is uh, a racist, systematically, systemically uh, racist. Uh, how do you look at the 4th of July? Is this a, a day and a time that's worth celebrating? It certainly is. I mean, the uh, New York Times, uh, 1619, uh, is not the start of the country. Uh, it was an important date, and a, an unfortunate date, when slavery was introduced into the Americas. But uh, the 4th of July tells us we were looking for freedom. And it's been a gradual, complete change for the better. It wasn't complete at once. There was slavery. There's a lot of problems. America solves its problems, makes progress. We, we look back to know our history, we can't forget it, but we know we're going forward. Mm-hmm. I do not believe we're in a racist nation. There's racist elements, people are racist, but the nation itself, we don't have apartheid here. That as a policy, sometimes it happens by accident, uh, sometimes even intentionally in particular places, but not as a national policy. Mm-hmm. It's much different. Good. Bishop, thanks so much, and I hope you enjoy your summer. I will. Thank okay. You. Okay, now back to the news desk. Thank you, Ed and Bishop DiMarzio. As we step towards normalcy, engaged couples are finally able to have their dream weddings. But after months of being forced out of work, vendors are now struggling to keep up with the new demand. I spoke with New York City-based vendors who are finally seeing a much-needed surge. Sharon Becker just got back from traveling for a wedding. But instead of a break, the makeup artist has to get ready for another gig. The last month since weddings picked up again has been totally bonkers, completely insane. I don't think I've ever felt anything like this before, and I've been doing this for 10 years now. But after the pandemic, the busy schedule is welcomed. It feels great. I'm so excited to be working again. Sharon's not alone. Wedding vendors across the city have seen a boom in business. According to the wedding report, 42% of weddings originally scheduled in 2020 were moved to a date this year. On top of that, with COVID restrictions lifted in New York, people can finally throw bigger weddings, and they are. Our phones have been ringing off the hook. Benjamin Goldberg runs the New York Food Truck Association. They have 75 members with over 125 trucks and they're booked pretty much every weekend. Food trucks have become a popular option for wedding food. In 2019, they had anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of their trucks booked on the weekends. In 2020, during the pandemic, that number dropped down below 5 percent. Now that number is close to 95 percent. There's still going to be a lot of scars for a long time to come, um, but this, this definitely helps get, get over that pretty quickly. Christian Rada, Director of Marriage, Family Formation and Respect Life Education for the Diocese of Brooklyn, has seen an increase in pending marriages too. I'm seeing uh, an increase in couples going uh, to, to, to pre-cana. Couples heading back to the church altar. They want to have family and friends gather together to celebrate this wonderful occasion of, of two people coming together and asking for God's blessing. It really is the summer of nuptials, more marriages, more families, and more businesses for wedding vendors, all much needed after this difficult year. Still to come on this special edition of Currents News, subway serenades are making a comeback as we step towards normalcy. Plus, the meeting that's become a web sensation will have the answer to why the Pope is shaking hands with Spider-Man when we return. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back.
The daily rhythm of New York is coming back as more people go back to working in person. And now the subways are getting their soundtracks back as performers come back to the platforms. I went underground at Port Authority in Manhattan to meet one. Listen closely through the unmistakable sounds of the morning commute. Music can be heard, a welcome sound. that has been missed for 14 months. I just get out of the train and was people being loud. And this is like, oh my God, this is what I miss about New York. It's so much more relaxing and soothing and, you know, welcoming because of the music. The MTA restarted its music under New York program, which was shut down during the pandemic. Reopening some of New York's most populated stages to about 350 performers, including Eganom. Coming back here, there's a different feel. And to now to have that option to say, you know what, I'm going to sign up. It's something that I'm definitely looking forward to. A delicate dance. His fingers move seamlessly across the trumpet, a gift he's been perfecting since fifth grade. The instrument was his solace after moving to New York from Nigeria. I used to get teased for my English. And so the band class was the one class that everybody had something to their mouth, so nobody was teasing me. And it became my safe haven. A safe haven and a beautiful gift that eventually became a job. That was threatened when the pandemic hit. It was rather tough, especially financially. You know, our industry was like literally shut down because we were predicated on being intimate with people. Eganon played in Central Park and held live stream concerts for 52 weeks straight never giving up on his great love. Music has that way of just bringing us, you know, life. Through his secular and non-secular songs, the Christian man is bringing life and a smile to commuters. It was such a treat to hear Eganon perform. He's so talented, but further, it was also an inspiration, a true sign that New York City is healing. From songs on the subway to screams by the sea, Coney Island is getting a brand new roller coaster with a very appropriate name. The Phoenix will be rising from the ashes of a turbulent year for Dino's Wonder Wheel and the amusement park industry as a whole. The almost 70 foot tall coaster will take flight on the 4th of July, sitting right next to the famous wheel. The family that owns the park decided on the name because the ride represents a shining beacon of fun in the darkness of the pandemic. Thousands attend Pope Francis's General Assemblies every year, but he doesn't get many superheroes, except for his most recent one where he met a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. The web slinger got to personally speak with the Pope and even gave a mask as a gift to the pontiff. But under the mask wasn't Peter Parker, it was an Italian man named Mattia Viardita. He wears the costume and visits children in the hospital all over the country. And that's it for this special edition of Currents News. I'm Emily Druby. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.